Hello and thanks for joining us. This is Glenn Kaiser from the Dolby Institute and I'm here um, today uh, thrilled to talk with the team behind uh, Rocket Man. Uh, and today at the table we have with us Danny Sheehan, who is the supervising sound editor, uh, Mike Collins, who is the supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer, uh, Mike Prestwood-Smith, also a re-recording mixer, and uh, especially lucky to have Chris uh, Dickens with us today, who is the picture editor on the film. So. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome to Los Angeles. Thank you. So Rocket Man, obviously, it's a biographical musical film based on the life of Elton John. Um, and it follows John uh, from his you know, very early days of his youth up through the meteoric rise of, of um, his musical career. And then in and, and a, and a sort of a progression that, that, we, that we've come to know and love, he, uh, he has his trials and tribulations with fame and, and drugs and fast living. Uh, and then there's a redemption story at the end. I think one of the things that's really remarkable about Rocket Man is uh, the tone and the way it decides to use Elton John's music, which is, as opposed to some other movies that have come out recently right. in the genre, <laughs> it's, uh, it's more of a movie musical. So you've got, you've got very stylized treatments of Elton John's songs, which are kind of used almost as score for the emotions of the of the movie. You've got other people than Elton John singing his songs um, in, in the narrative flow of the picture, and it's very, it's almost treated like a fantasy. So I'm kind of curious uh, for you, Chris, was that, you know, was that part, was that always part of the concept of the film in terms of the script writing that the songs would be used in this very sort of fantastical manner? Yes, pr pretty much. Although I, I read a version of the script about a year before the film was actually made and it, it still had that, but to a slightly lesser extent. But it was that the, the intention was always to, for the songs to illustrate his life in, in a particular way. And that would be, you know, um, used not necessarily at the times that he wrote them, in his life, they were used wherever they were applicable to a certain situation, and that was always the case, and that was what attracted me, me to the project. Um, and then, secondly, the way that they were used to illustrate was always, always a slightly fantastical, you know, had an element, but that got pushed more and more during the, you know, as as the script developed, and then during the production. And for me, that was is the most exciting thing about about this film because. For an editor, that gives you a whole lot of opportunities to, you know, be creative with both the picture editing, the sound, the way you use music, and all of those things. So um, it was always part of its DNA. It just got pushed, and I'm sure we'll talk about the, the details of that as we just got pushed into more into that direction as as we got into the editing and and that part of it. Yeah, I've got lots of questions about specific sequences, but I'm kind of curious from like a, a basic um, workflow standpoint, um, you know, typically with uh, uh, even a big studio picture, um, the sound team comes in relatively late in the process, but obviously that's not going to work on a, on a movie like this. So can, can you guys talk a little bit about at what point you became involved and at, you know, I, I presume that there was a big pre-record process yeah. that happened before the shoot? Yeah, I mean, Giles Martin was hired to produce the music, uh, once they'd settled on Taron as the, as the lead. And I think they did quite a few tests with Taron to make sure that was all going to work. And then, so he started the pre-records way before the shoot so that they were all ready to go when, when the shoot fired up. And he saw the project all the way through. And actually, it's a shame he's not here because he brought an immense amount to it. Uh, you know, he had to construct the, not only just re-record the songs uh, and get Taron's vocal in line, but also then orchestrate a sort of, sort of cinematic version of those songs around it. All, all the whilst uh, sort of evolving it with the cut as it went along. Whilst we were changing it. Yeah. <laughs> so so he, he was very early on, you know, with that. And you, you guys were on early with the records and stuff with yeah. Taron particularly, yeah, weren't you? Yeah, but yeah. I didn't really get into it until... We didn't even tempt this film, did we? we just, not till No, no not really. There was really. a couple of like, yeah. early tempts, maybe... F maybe a, a couple. You wasn't around. You right. wasn't available at the time. But, but uh, uh, They were kind of pretty advanced yeah. in terms of temps, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I was quite late on in the game, <clears throat> but there was a, a lot of preparation that went on, you know, but to get it up and running. The, the, the idea, you know, it was always conceived that it would be pre-records and there would be, he would work to those, but also on the shoot, you know, we captured all the live sound too, so there was always that option for Chris. Well, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask about that because, <clears throat> you know, obviously I think one of the things that's interesting about the movie is that Taron is doing, he's yeah. singing Elton John, yeah. you know, him, himself, which must have been just a kind of a terrifying thing for, for, for him to do, right? But so 
Right. So my, the question that you teed up perfectly was, you know, in a, in a sort of a traditional musical template, you would go pre-record all the songs, they would lip sync on the set, um, and then you would pretty much default to the pre-records in, in the mix. But because the actors were doing the singing, were they also doing live singing on set? And yeah. then how did you, yeah. were there, are there, are there, yeah. are there some instances in which what we hear in the final film is actually them singing on set Absolutely, versus, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A mixture of. It's a mixture of. I, I, I actually spoke with Andy Patterson, who was our music editor during it, uh, along with Cecile Turnsack. But he, he, he was on set doing all the playback. Because um, I, I wanted to get the exact number of what, what, what he thought the li amount of live versus pre-record were at the end of it. And, and we came up to about, we think it was about 20% live, about 80% pre-record. I mean, it was very, quite a key thing to be able to use some of the, 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 the what was shot, because it kind of is about performance. Right. Because with a pre-record, yeah. you, you, you have a limit to where you can go with that. And so if you, 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 can, you, you can tap into, even if actually you don't use it in the mix, you can tap into what was actually happening with the performance on the floor, which is what I, I worked with yeah. the whole time. And then, of course, Giles and his team would, went back and re-recorded Taron's vocals again later to the picture to the new picture edit. So they, there was an opportunity. Oh, so, so there's, there's a whole nother. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Parsons, yeah. Absolutely. Maybe yeah. several. So there, so there was really was, there's a, there's a whole, the, the, the way that this film operated in terms of its, was never, nothing, nothing was finished. They were, the, there was no playbook. No. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Except, except the overall, the overarching um, idea of the film, which was to do it this way, fantastical, whatever, yeah. with Taron singing. So that I found, I, yeah. I worked on a musical where that was entirely uh, Les Miserables, which was like completely done on the floor. Right. And that was the intention, i.e. to get the rawness of All performance. All the live singing, on, yeah. But, right. but it, it, well, in the end it was not, because they went, I have always went into the studio to re-record the back, the, you, because you could, to get the, to get the, the musical performance and the clarity. And also with this, you know, often the narrative was woven in around the singing, so he had he'd be singing, then there'd be some dialogue, and then exactly. back to singing again. So, you know, there's so many joins there that had to be worked out that uh, sometimes... Well, and it's really important because you don't, want, you don't want to have that 1950s and 1960s thing of where, you know, it's production dialogue and yeah. then suddenly pristine singing yeah. kicks in. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that would have broken the illusion, which is clearly yeah. not, not what we want. And a big thing for Dex as well at the beginning, wasn't it? It was a big conversation that he didn't want that. That was exactly what he didn't want. And I think the last couple of musicals he's worked on still had that element to it too. So there was these early conversations with Andy, music editor, the sound recordist on set, to kind of get them to record in a way that give us all these options later on. So what would be the kind of production sound? Even if there was playback, they were still recording everything. So we could kind of use that later for even matching ADR. It's very important that yeah. to be, have access to that. Yeah, the actual yeah. live. And sometimes he would go off kilter a bit, so he would do a few playback takes. And then there'll be takes where he just kind of went solo. So even within there, there was pieces that we could grab, bit a little smile or breath or just anything that could then be tied into the yeah. post records sure. or some of the pre-records. And so kind of giving all that stuff to Mike, so he's got all those options to mix. It was a real key thing, actually, that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Andy Patterson's actually a musician himself, and for some of the takes, he would play a keyboard on set and feed into Taron's ear so Taron could just kind of freestyle a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, so that was another aspect of it yeah, as well. It was some of the songs were done like that completely. I, mean, I Want Love was done just with a piano accompaniment. And, so we had and your song, I think, was... Your song know. as well, Well, your song yeah. is a really beautiful example of just, yeah. like, it's just Elton like, singing. Almost live, as, as it was. It was shot like that. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that that, uh, uh, that I, I really buy that that was the creative process for how that song um, was written. You well, know, just look, open, open, open up the sheet with the lyrics and it just flows right out in I one continuous that. take. I said that <laughs> to... David Elton's husband. Sure, David Furnish. Uh -huh. And he said, um, because he had told us to make it longer, because he says that wasn't what the creative that, that wasn't what the creative process was. He says he says I, I make it longer, and I did I did I put like a forty seconds in where he's finding the song and sure. all this. It was it was absolutely brilliant. I thought he showed it to <laughs> Elton, and he said, no, that isn't how it was. It <laughs> happened very quickly. Is that right? Yeah. So that who knows what. The uh, absolute truth is because there may be he may be just preserving the myth, his own myth. But sure. it, it may well be. But and, and of course we weren't there, so we don't know, do we? we but at a certain level, I mean, it's 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 a it's a fun thing it's a fun yes. thing to talk about. But at a certain level, it doesn't really matter because 
one of the things I love about this movie is that you know, f right from the first ten minutes, you set this fantastical tone. I'm thinking about that that you know that flashback that goes into is it the bitch's back yeah. right yeah, at the opening, right, yeah. and everybody's singing, and you've got a dance number on the streets, and it's sort of like I I, I like to talk. I, I, usually with artists, I end up talking about the first ten minutes and the decisions that you make as artists to kind of set the set the world mm -hmm. and set the the rules of the cinematic language that you're going to use to tell the story. And from that at that point, you're sort of like, okay, now. I understand that this is going to be very fantastical in tone, so I don't need to take things literally. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it, was a, it, was a, it was a very powerful way to open the film. Yeah, I think you you mentioned just recently the, a, the kitchen yeah. sink versus. It was a problematic part of the film. The opening. It was very hard to get right, and it, and in in we um, we can talk about the key to it. It was because we had to you had to set the tone right, and uh, even sometimes even more than story, you need to set the tone up there, and that. Is to do with what's happening on the soundtrack, the music, this and that, and it was always sort of planned as a, as a sequence where he'd burst into the rehab room, and then the boy, his younger self, would interrupt that. Right. Um, but w w we had issues with it in that it, he he would do that. He burst into the room, but it was too realistic, and it just felt like we were going into a slightly more you know the, a, a realistic world, and in even when the little boy came in, it was a little, it was problematic because rather than Taron singing the first bars of the song, it was the little boy. The little boy, boy right. Mm -hmm. And then we had major issues with that, with people that when we had screenings of people that didn't think it worked very well. And, hmm. we, and so we... And was it because it wasn't quite fantastical enough or what was, or, the, what was the issue? It was also, but a combination of, of things that didn't sit right and um, in terms of where you, how you started off and it, Taron had a few lines right. that he sung a cappella or with a mm -hmm. little bit. And then the boy came in and interrupted that, which is, if you think about it, you've just had a chance to hear your star singing. Sure. And then you cut it off with a boy who's actually singing in a different register and it's not as beautiful. So we, we reshot it. We redid that sequence and we had more of, we had Taron sing the whole of the first part of the song and then the boy appears in a different way. Mm. And then, and then, therefore, we he, he he recorded that live, and then the score was sort of written underneath. Yeah, it, it was a mixture of things. On, so on production, I think with that particular song, he started on production. Yeah. So that's how he started singing, and then he went across to possibly some post, I think, for the new pickups, mm -hmm. and then back to the old pre-record, and then a mixture of things throughout. Oh, so yeah. you were just you you were, you were throwing everything at the wall that you had, more right? or less. Yeah. yeah, you're using all of the pre-records yeah. and the like. That's interesting. I mean, and it's also that beginning is shows you what's going on with the with the in, you know we made it extremely fantastic. He bursts through in his sequins and he's coming down the corridor sure. and it, it's mad loud. You got that music, long sequence where he walks down the hall. Yeah, yeah, so loud yeah. and I. You're expecting him to burst out on stage or something like that, and he doesn't. Yeah. He's in a room with eight people, and it's rehab. Yeah. So of course that therein is that's a joke, that's a funny moment, but which is produced by the soundtrack. Yeah. You know the way the way that mm -hmm. you operate, all yeah. the decisions we made were about that. So immediately you set in motion in pe people's minds. Okay, this is not this is a different experience. Sure. And, they, and when they're used to that, you can then go into different places. Also, oh, wasn't that sequence quite a bit longer, The Bitches Back, for a while? I'm afraid, yeah. Well, yes, it was longer, yeah. and we, we had to cut... I think we cut it down a bit as much. But in a way, it we could have bit felt too front-heavy with the too much, yeah, yeah. number and stuff. So I yeah. think it, it was indicative of the whole film, like pacing and all, all those things. It's crucial to yeah. set that up. Yeah, and you don't, you don't have to fire all your ammunition yeah, in the yeah. first sequence yeah. because you've got... I'm also thinking about just the brilliant sequence at the at the troubadour with crocodile rock right where literally the audience starts to levitate mm -hmm. off the ground yeah. and it's just a, it's a wonderful sort of visual metaphor for the excitement that yeah. they're uh so uh danny and and matt i want to ask you sort of given this fantastical treatment and the tone of the film what kind of possibilities did that open up for you from a sound design perspective in terms of uh you know, ambiences, backgrounds, sound effects, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think um, sort of quite an important aspect of the film is is how much you keep in touch with reality through the fantastical moments and how you drift into those. So that was um, probably quite a big focus in terms of the design um, and just what you heard and, and, and how much of the real world you heard. Because you never wanted to, whenever wanted to distract from the music, that was always a driving force. So 
it was trying to keep people in touch with the scene because the songs were narrative. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a song in a uh, score in a conventional sense where you're sat there as a viewer listening to it. It was trying to keep you in that scene with the character that's singing, so keep it feeling real without it being clashing or, or distracting. So that was, that was kind of a, a general thing um, that in terms of the approach. And then sometimes concentrating on the fantastical and, and trying to heighten that. Um, so that was, a, that was generally the decisions we, we were and taking. To unify in terms of them. It was also, wasn't it? it, was so that you weren't jumping from one to another. And yeah, so yeah. the transitions, but generally when the sound design was playing with the music, it was trying to make it feel part of it, so they lived together. It, um, Dexter was really keen to keep the vocal feeling like you were in touch with it, it was actually happening on the screen. In the room time. sort of thing. In the room, so little, yeah. sorry I'm jumping in, but yeah. little bits of detail to connect the reality of what's going on to support the performance, so you never felt like you were just being sung to, it was all actually happening. And also it meant it, it was easier to therefore get in and out of reality because there was always a layer of that throughout the, the numbers themselves. So, and actually finding out what, what those layers are and the density of those layers and how to play those, you know, each song had its own version of that balancing point. And it was just, it was finding that, yeah, that balancing point as much yeah. as anything. I think I heard a, a, an interview that you did where you were talking about sound in terms of sometimes what we do is the sound of what the characters hear in the scene and the music is the sound that the viewer hears in the scene. And I think this kind of turned it on its head a little bit where the music was what the character was hearing as well. So therefore, it sort of influenced how, what we were trying to do as well. So that, that's definitely made it quite interesting. What, what I observed with the soundtrack, which I thought for me was a really interesting thing, is how the, mu the music way of mixing and the film way of mixing is kind of met. You had to you had to work on that because yeah. of course we because they are what quite do you mean different. By the, what do you mean well, there's different disciplines. The way that you would mix yeah. an album, mix a song yeah. for an album, right. because of right. course we're having to we're going you're adapting what were originally songs mixed that way many you're, years you're, ago, and then yeah. obviously they started Giles off as, as 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 record songs, yes. and then you're using them as score. But then of course then you've got Giles Martin, who is also very famous for yeah, mixing exactly. album music. Yeah, he well, comes in and does, and his approach so, is very so. much make it sound like a song. Right. And, there, and then when it came to us, and, and you know, it was then, we then had to kind of manipulate that to, to make that connect with the pictures as well. I mean, more than manipulate, it's yeah. a huge job. And, yeah. and the whole, the way that the, the sound design and the effects supported that. Exactly. Yeah. And every, because it was, it was really quite difficult to do. Uh, and I saw it with some of the, yeah. one of the temp mixes we did where you kind of felt, things felt unified stylistically, but not yeah. sonically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you yeah. confusing where, where where you are, the the space, and that you know there are some scenes like Crocodile Rock, like we were talking about, which feels like you're there. It's a real yeah. gig, yeah. isn't it? Well, that <clears throat> right. So that you actually have a certain amount of leeway with a sequence like that because you're in a music club, yeah. so it's supposed to feel like a big music performance. Yeah. But then you've also got you've got Elton John songs that kind of pop out in restaurants and various places where, you know, the, obviously it's much more fantastical. So the, the, the acoustic treatment of the music has to be very different. Yeah, I mean, in, in the Troubadour, that was the, the feeling was to make it as real as possible. Right. So lots of perspectives, lots of shape on the, on the singing and the music with a view to then at that point when the audience lift off to just flick the switch and just go into fantasy completely. Sure. And one of the things I loved about the movie and watching it now is the dynamic. There's a, there's a very dynamic a lot of dynamic range, not just sonically, but emotionally in the film. And I think we always looked for those moments where we could really just dramatically sort of pull the rug from, from under the, the audience at that moment and really switch it up. And that, uh, I thought it was such an audacious bit of filmmaking, that whole lifting up. And then the minute they land, they were back into reality again. You know, it was a... It's so, it's so simple, but yeah. it's just so powerful from a, like yeah. a, a thematic stagecraft kind of point yeah. of view. It's really, it was really... They actually had all those sequence. people on wires. Really? Yeah. Well, I guess you would. Paint, yeah, yeah, they didn't. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't. Yeah, they. They were. I think there was one shot they shot at a thousand frames a second or something for it, but we, it didn't work. With them just leaving. It didn't work. Yeah, we yeah, used yeah. these for a trailer, and it just didn't work because they looked frozen. Whereas if you, they come up on a wire, there's still there's still some kind of movement in their faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. that was an example. So a combination of things, wasn't it? With because he originally sung that live, Crocodile Rock. So he did that live on set. And then he wanted to improve his performance, so he then did that as a post-record, which Mike then sort of worked with. He kind of EQ'd everything, making it all in, in the club, PA sounding. Because it was so quiet, it was so silent when he comes out because he's so nervous, there's a moment where there's just nothing happening but him just sort of sitting there at the microphone. And we were able to go back to production and again just 
grab all these tiny little nuances that were on his original performance, like that sort of microphone <sighs> across the mic and a few little inhales. So just in between the singing, just to knit it all together with what Mike had done too, kind of again just sat it on the screen, like you know, as a little trick for that kind of scene, was a combination of that. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it could because it, it is a film about quite an emotional film and about performance and and it's so, so often i get upset when you lose that because you replace the dialogue yeah. with ADR and you can get it right you miss the breath but you rarely you things, rarely get exactly the yeah same yeah thing. exactly yeah often it's the little pieces the little tiny bits that actually connect you to it so what i, I mean what i'm hearing you guys describe is a, a mixed process that entailed a lot of experimentation um so can let's talk a little bit about you know about the mix process, how long did it take? How involved was, was Dexter there every day? Did he come in and hear playbacks and give notes? Or like yeah. how, how involved was he in the mixing yeah, process? Yeah, he's, he's very involved. But obviously, it was a quite a tight schedule. Um, we had four or five weeks to really finish this uh, in terms of final mix. And at that point, I think the release date was coming up fast. And you know he's got a lot to do, a lot of visual effects, editing. Um, <laughs> great. There was never there was never locked picture to yeah, work with. None of that, no. No. Um, well, I, I didn't want to I didn't want to ask a question about that too because um, when I was doing some research, it, lo it looked like the schedule on this was unbelievably tight. Yeah. Dexter, they finished shooting what late two thousand eighteen, like October. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then you premiered it at Cannes yeah. the following May. Yeah. So it was that's super super tight. Like seven Fast. months for all of post production. Yeah. 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 But in terms of Dexter's involvement, you know, we, early on, we there's a, a number. Saturday Nights Alright for Fighting was one of the one of the big first set pieces we did, uh, where it was a bit of a we we actually ended up returning to that quite often to see what we'd done because that was the first time we could sort of understand how it was going to work sonically um, with the songs and the reality. We're talking about this layer of reality and how much reality to put in before it started becoming too literal and it's very subjective that stuff. So. We spent some time on that and visited it a few times. And then I think once we got it into the sort of ballpark for Dexter, that, that became a bit of a, right, that's, that's the way we want to go. That became a template? Yeah. <clears throat> so it meant that Dexter could then let us do a lot of that work offline and then come and review and fine tune with him. But what we found was that really each song had its own requirement. You know, sometimes you didn't want too much literal stuff in there. In the, in the uh, yeah. swimming pool, we tried it very literally for a while uh, before he came up, came up and came out and did this whole Rocket Man thing. And it just got too literal, and that song just demanded much more of a fantasy sort of feel. They, they do all have a different treatment. Yeah. And, and I think great musicals do. It's like sure. you need an idea for each one that's going to be marked out. It's different. Yeah. And for instance, you yeah. know, like in the song I Want Love is all of the, the family singing mm -hmm. with, a, with an orchestral, like quite a lush kind of... You know, no, the classic kind of thing, and it was you don't really do that anywhere else in in that the, was, in that the was film. Kind of opposite. That was all shot in the sh that was all like studio records, which Mike had to kind of make sound real, like it was live singing because they all sung that in the studio and with Matt Foley and the kind of effects tied around that. The whole selling of that scene was that we needed to be in there. It's, oh, it's one of the quietest ones, which is actually one of the so, hardest ones yeah. to get right. Isn't that always the way? Yeah. Like it's yeah, yeah. when it, it's it's the quiet ones oh, that yeah. really are, no that, that really yeah. vex you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Talk about about uh, uh, let's 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 open up that Rocket Man sequence and talk about you know the the pool and and then that goes into the stadium, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it goes into well, he goes into it onto a gurney and then he goes into a ambulance and then backstage. You're covering a lot of narrative ground, but you're also covering a lot of stylistic ground because there's a there's that that song obviously goes through several different acoustic mm -hmm. treatments as you, as you yeah. go through this journey. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it was it was a kind of unique one in that sense because it actually went from real proper fancy. I mean, he's in a swimming pool singing, singing at the bottom it's of the like, pool, right? So that, literally, yeah. we know that this couldn't. I mean, happen. at one point, yeah. we're thinking, should we put bubbles on him? What should we do? You know, you, you start thinking. But, about but he did. Stuff. It did start with him at a party. Yeah. Sure. Which is slightly more realistic, but yeah. again stylized. Yeah, we, yeah. we flicked the switch. Drunk. We flicked the switch once he started yeah. downing the pills. We just yeah. started dialing in the sort of fantasy components at that point. So by, by the time he started walking through the house, it all got kind of quite subjective. And then the pool was a bit of a null point when he dived in. Uh, uh, so, and that's where the song started. So I guess we teed it up, like you say. We did tee it and up. And there was a bit of then. space to do do some stuff with the sound there, because I think it was about... It was yeah. about making it feel like you've gone into another world. Yeah. It's, it's a, like a pivotal part of the film where he meets him, his younger self again right. underwater. So yeah. you had to well, feel and, like and you were there. And from a sound perspective, quite literally, you know, when, when your main character downs a, ha a fistful <laughs> of pills, it gives you a remarkable opportunity to introduce some, yeah. some subjectivity into the Absolutely. soundtrack, right? 
from experience. Yeah, I think throughout, really, it's his his imagination coming into the the story and those those constant shifts that that gave the sound sort of opportunities to to go with that. Um, are there any are there are there any specific like what are your favorite you know little bits of those moments that you th that you think Can about when you think about that, the film? That, that, because sure, that's yeah. one of them for me. Sorry, is that you know you go from this the loneliness of this pool and this sort of weird dark subjectivity and and, and him taking these pills because he's in a big crowd of a big party but he's just actually on his own to uh, to this stadium when he's got that hundreds of thousands of people singing along with his song. You know, I love that. The idea that there's someone on their own, completely and isolated, and, and yet they've got these this adoring mass yeah, of people yeah. singing along. It's and the song is about loneliness, isn't it? About yeah. it was that whole t uh, time of the race, uh, the, the space race, and, sure. and the, the sort of um, the connection between going into space and being alone and stuff. So that that whole song is kind of about that as well. Mm -hmm. So and it did happen. That's what he did before that concert. Really? It, that, yeah. He his family came. He couldn't cope with it. He took a load of pills and threatened to and jumped in the pool, and then I think about a week later did that concert. So he it was a, it's all based that essentially was you know based on a you know something that happened. That's crazy. Let's talk about um, obviously that's the famous Dodgers uh, Stadium sequence with which is sort of the end of that that kind of Rocket Man montage. So how do you um, you know walk us through the, the the sound elements of that scene and how, how do you? How do you put your performer into a stadium of 80,000 people who are actually singing his song back to him? It was difficult as well because there was no, we didn't actually have any sound for it. It was all shot, kind of green screen visual effects. So there was nothing there. And I presume that they were shooting with just what, a couple dozen actors that they would then replicate, or uh, extras sure that they would replicate. No, we no, didn't have it. anybody, no, any no. crowd there at all that was all shot later as little pods uh, in there. Nothing, nothing except Taron singing. Yeah. No, not even that. I think it was all playback, that one. Yeah, yeah, no, it wasn't. It was all playback, yeah. yeah. None of it is real, yeah. obviously. And it all had to be recreated. We did get in touch with Elton John's team because he was touring at the time to see if we could go with microphones and record like them. Record singing. the crowd? Yeah. But oh, because, of course, the crowd sings back to him at his shows, back, right? Yeah, there's yeah. a big moment where they all come out and he's listening, he's standing on the stage, you know, not kind of going like that, but it is a bit like that's what carries that little section. And so we had to build that up. Matt went on location and recorded those. There was a scene that we were going to shoot uh, that they were going to shoot, and it didn't make the film. But there was 200 extras, so Matt went down and shot some of that. We kind of got crowd guys in to do it, and just built layers and layers and layers up. And then Mike obviously mixed that to get that sound in the stadium. But that was a moment where Dexter, I remember watching it, and he was kind of like, "That's like it was just really good." It landed <laughs> in there at one point. But but also you but yeah. you've got the song, but because even though it sounds real. It's actually not actually what's going on, is it? It's the feeling of because because the music's playing, but not necessarily how it would sound at, no. a, at that gig. No, that was it. It's it's um, one of those funny ones that sort of sit between both worlds. It's mm -hmm. because it's come from this fantasy. You couldn't then suddenly get all super literal. It, sure. And also, I didn't want to lose scale at that point. I mean, for me, that's mm -hmm. kind of the apex of the film. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, and, it, and it had to be the boldest, biggest moment, you know, and so the music just had to just go, and actually the way it's orchestrated, it is continually building all the way up to the end, so, mm. you know, that really led it, the music again just led the, 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 that, that feeling, but having that sort of scale of music and crowd, and then or obviously all the explosions and the rocket and all that stuff going off was, yeah. yeah. So help me understand, Danny, Matt, Mike, uh, Danny and, and Matt, your co-sound supervisors, um, Matt and Mike, you're co-re-recording mixers. So what's the division? Like, who's doing what on the team? Well, I, I take care of mu <laughs> music and dialogue. Uh, so, uh, so I had all of the score, all of the source music, all of the performance music, and the dialogue, and some of the crowd. Yeah, and then Matt obviously does the sound design and takes care of all your backgrounds and Foley. And yeah, so we had uh, Rob Turner and Rob Prynne and Michael uh, Fenton were doing design and I, I would supervise that side of things and then mix mix the design. And Danny uh, is across the dialogues and... Uh, yeah. So I kind of I kind of clean up dialogues, get everything working for Mike, do all of the crowd and then kind of just a creative influence with everyone in the mix, like it's a collaborative thing all the way through at that point. But that's my side of what I do. I deliver that to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, of course, we have to talk about Dolby Atmos a little bit. Um, this is a great Atmos track, and especially I think the music gave you guys some some wonderful opportunities to to play very creatively. But I wanted to back up a little bit because 
um, I know that Giles Martin did a lot of the pre-records at Abbey Road, yeah. and they utilized the Dolby Atmos room at Abbey Road, right? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how yeah. that worked and how, so, how how useful that was for you yeah. in terms of using Atmos in the final mix. Yeah, um, quite early on, I, th I spoke to Giles, and we spoke about the workflow and how we're going to do it. And I said they were going to do a, a mix of the music um, prior to the final mix. Uh, and I, I was quite... Uh, um, I, wanted, I, I really wanted that to be done on a theatrical stage because I just know how different it is to mixing it on a regular sort of music stage. They were going to do a mix of the music before the final mix for the purpose of what? So, so in any any score, any anything like that, you've got to do a balance so that if it's playing as a sort of piece in itself, okay. then deliver that balance in stems. And at that point, those stems then get mixed by me with all the other elements that are going on. And sometimes you have to change a lot of that stuff to make it work. But in this case, they mixed the they mixed all the tracks in five one, I think either five one or seven one, I think it was five one, with a view and a very wide with a view to me then choosing what to do with those and make objects in the final mix, which I think is a great thing because there's so many so much sound that needed to get in, that uh, making those decisions too early, sometimes it's just you they had to do it like that because I know they started mixing. We'd had some mixes which were more weren't done like that yeah and baked in stuff was yeah it, it, you couldn't really pull it apart yeah and yeah and when you get all the components that's when you can really make that choice but that was when i that, so at that point when it arrived at, on at my mixing desk it was very split and i could then take components of it and start making the atmos sound feel from that and what i what i found worked well is you know most of these are grounded in rock and roll songs you know sure. so there's drums bass guitar and songs that we know very well and songs we know well but what what um, Jars had delivered was a beautiful layer of cinematic sound uh, you know synths and strings and all these things sometimes really odd things I think in the swimming pool he used like a whole piano wire scraping down and just all sorts of stuff lots of things for me to basically have fun with and really open up the sound in the room. And also, it gave us by doing so, it gave us a bit more space on the screen to let some of the other things play, like the reality, this layer of reality we're talking about. It meant that we weren't all crushed on the screen. It meant that there was some space for crowds and, and you had some space to open things up yeah. and move things, yeah, yeah, move things off the screen. A bit. Yeah, but it was a, it was really having the stuff that Giles made it for that. It was a real gift because so much of that stuff worked beautifully in in Atmos. It was, and there's a lot of movement in it. It's. Uh, I'm always so impressed with Atmos. The subtle things, yeah, actually, are the ones that you are, are, are something else because it's so easy to say, "Oh, yeah, it's loud. You can put stuff." Big stadium moments, sure. You put stuff all over, right? But what 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 do you yeah. think about specifically? Is well, there just, a sequence that kind of you know, comes well, to mind? Well, I mean, the Rocket Man is one yeah. one example of that. Being underwater, it's like it's not loud. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's I mean, loud, quite but, but you're, you're, you've really got things going on in, in a very point. particular way. It's it's kind of. I won't say realistic, because but it, but in a way it is. You feel that the subtlety is what really makes you feel more mm -hmm. part of what's going on on the screen. I think you know, and also um, just being immersed by music in that pool, yeah. and a lot of it moving around. It, I think it really worked narratively. You know, the music was connecting narratively to the feeling of the pool. As much as you can, you're giving the audience the experience. Kind of, of yeah, them. yeah, 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 yeah. So with that, the mu having the music split that way uh, and all the numbers was brilliant. You know, it meant we could really get in and play around with the, with the Atmos sound field and that. And I, I know that you've spent time in there as well. Yeah, yeah, it was nice. I mean, it's nice just going to Abbey Road and sitting with, with Giles Martin, who's obviously George Martin's son, and just being in that environment. But that, just that whole kind of early involvement and those discussions. And there was such a willingness all around just to kind of do whatever it took to make the film better. And um, there was definitely a buzz about the film and excitement and the energy that that brought. Um, but it's just a really kind of nice collaborative um, You also had a score, because we had a composer on the film as well, right. Matt Margison, who was writing. Yeah. So because there was another another element there that we had to, I mean, during the editing of, of, of it, we were working on with that more creatively and what themes we would use here and there. And, and was the was the idea that the score would kind of provide some like connective tissue between the songs and just sort of ease you yeah. in and out of various transitions? It was, although definitely that's what we started doing and we explored themes. We found that we had to use themes from Elton's music sure. mostly to, to to glue. Sure. But but which was something we developed 
you know, over time, and we and, and I think it worked very successfully. But actually, Matt was also having a go at some of the orchestrations. And oh, really? Of the, yes, of course. And so, of course, that him and Giles actually did. I think Giles mixed his 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 music, didn't he, in the yeah. same space? So yeah, yeah. they actually came together as well in that way, in that they had which just makes it all the more cohesive. Yeah, two different yeah. approaches essentially. The, the the way that a film. But it's very it subtle. I mean, the score yeah. sort of you never out of touch with Elton's themes, and sometimes they're quite subtle and sort of echoes of what. Mm. So you have got this layer of his music coming at you, but then you've got an, a sort of resonant layer of it. It had coming be, in and out as well underneath. Yeah, it had to be there. We found that that what happened that 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 when you didn't glue it together that way, you just got into a, the real world too much. Right. And this is, was happening in the picture, and that would have happened in the soundtrack as well. As you, we needed to, we need we tightened it up. We tightened up the gaps between the the music numbers, and sometimes made them longer depending on what was necessary. But but it, if if you let go of the whole musical element and that feel, and it becomes too literal it for too much of time, so you really had to yeah. you really had to keep that yeah. going, and and that was essentially what Matt, the, the composer, worked on with us. But as I say, it was so difficult to say where one person's mm. job stopped and another one started because it just ev as as, and the other thing you've got to remember is that everything was evolving during that short editing process time. You know. Both you were the kind music, of sure the music cut. was coming together. Everything was kind exactly. of everything, everything. All the pots were coming the to a boil at the, the same sound, time. And the sound, you know, once you get into the mix, you've done a temp. You think, well, that worked. That didn't work. And then you have you roll that back into the you know the picture side of it, make some changes, and then. And then you premiere the movie at Cannes. Was the film done at that point, uh, or did you go back yeah, into it? I think it, it was done. It actually. was. I think the release was a week later. <laughs> I think right? it was oh, done. Was that right? Yeah. Wow. So there was yeah. no going back really at that point. Yeah, but I think it had only been done about a week. That is amazing. So yeah. So, uh, Matt, was um, was the film always going to be Dolby Atmos? Uh, was that part of the original concept? Yeah, as far as I was yeah, aware of it was, yeah. So did that affect how you made decisions about sound design and, and building tracks? Or how, were you working in, a, in, an, in an Atmos room as you were designing, or when did that? Yeah, so we've got, we, um, me and Danny have got a, a place um, in North London that, that's got a, it's Dolby Atmos. So we, I tend to track lay uh, in, in Atmos, and... It's more of making the, the choices, making the decisions about what I'm going to move and, and really kind of nailing that is on the final mix stage, the actual movement itself, but it's more the choice of what, what is going to be doing that and, and when to do it. So, um, yeah, and I've, I actually don't... I actually quite like the going from Dolby Atmos down to the other formats as well. I think when, when we first started working on Atmos, there was a, a slight fear of we're mixing in a format that some people aren't going to hear this in and should we... Should we be monitoring a 7.1 and then flicking across to Atmos? But I actually think you just work in a more detailed way with Atmos that then does actually translate really nicely to 7.1 and then and then 5.1. So, um, yeah, I actually like working in that format. So We're happy to hear you say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I know you started your career um, in, in on the sound side before you very wisely moved into uh, into, into picture. <laughs> Traitor. 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 But, uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious, I mean, obviously that, that gives you a vocabulary to talk with these guys and to, and just a different way of maybe thinking about how they're working. Like, so how does that experience change how you work with the sound team and, and do you bring them in earlier than other picture Ma actors? Maybe. Might? I mean, I, I mean, I don't have a very technical, that's, that's the one area I can't really converse but I but I was always into sound and music always into it as part of the editing process so I suppose because I, I what I'm interested in and I and, I, and essentially it's what film, the, the art of filmmaking is is how they work together yeah. it's how sound and picture and music Absolutely. function that what you hear what you don't hear what and that allows you to feel emotions tell a story and you know like when Elton's fished out of the water do you hear the people's do you not hear them? How much? You know, this is all those things really can produce incredible reactions and in, like silence in a cinema. You don't often get it, but it's an incredible thing. You just have to have nothing. It's so rare, and then maybe bring sounds in. So I'm very, very interested in that, the dynamics of it, not so much the technical side of it. And mm. so that that's, I suppose, what it is. I would love to get sound on early as early as possible, but there just normally isn't the money. Sure. So I try and scratch it together with my my team, of, of you know. But it, there's you have to have the will, the director and the producers have to be with you on that. Of course, essentially. Yeah. And in the past, I've done films with directors who were so into the soundtrack that they 
we've tried to do it in the mm -hmm. in the picture side, and you you never can get there because yeah. you just don't have the tools. And and yeah. obviously, what I try and get get you know Matt and Danny, anyone involved, so that we get your stuff. Also, the sooner that stuff gets it. into the film, yeah. the sooner it starts living. In exactly, the and then we all own it rather than that. Yeah. A terrible thing happens with. You, you know, we've done something in the cutting room and then it gets replaced because you replace it because it maybe isn't very good yeah. or not good enough. But, but we, it's we what don't, you're we used haven't to it. That's what and, you've been living and with. And I months, can deal right. with that, but like often directors can't deal with the change, right. which is that's, the pro that's when it's problematic. And I really liked, I mean, having said this, I love to be able to, what I really love is a magical moment is you've been working on a picture of a film and you've been doing, and it's when you get on the stage for the first time, I'm you hear it's it. It's still magical. It's magic. It's like the film coming back from the lab, the, the, you know, it's like that. It's like, what are you going to get? Right. And that, that moment, I just, you know, I would yeah. never want to lose because, yeah. you know, you could never hear it in Dol Dolby Atmos. You know, you don't, very, you don't have the, the cutting around, sure. really. I suppose you could try, but it's never the same. So, yeah, try and get involved early, but also try and allow the new things in. Very important, that. It was a good influence with the first temps, though. Like, you were very present there, and you were leading those quite a lot. Because I know Dexter was not around all the time, because um, there was so much going on. But they did kind of set the seed for some things. You know, we did yeah. kind of go down certain roads because of those early temps, which then come back into your habit. Yes, so they that come back to us. sort of live with those for a bit, yeah. We have to do I mean, obviously, Dex Dexter works with me a lot more, more during that pr process. And, of course, yeah. we get the temp mix back and put it we cut with that rather than with the original track. Sure. So you're, you're building on all of these elements. And, you know, it's quite hard to second guess any director. And De I mean, you, ultimately, you, having Dexter there any, yeah. like, in the room when yeah. you're doing those yeah. first mixes is vital, isn't it? Because yeah. then you, you know what, you know what the they is. do and don't. That's like. right. That's right. Is it, and then, well, at least then you can have a discussion. You may about not be it able to predict thing. what he will like, but you can certainly predict what he won't like. Right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. All helps. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but also all being there at that point is important, isn't it? Sure. So that then the development of the, the surprises are sort of smaller, yeah. not those big surprises where like, what's that? What have you done to my? Yeah. It's a loss what of control. Exactly. To my what did you do my movie? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The loss of control, isn't it? The feeling that I'm not loss in control. Of control of and I and felt it myself in, at times. And yeah. you think, well, it, you know, all the all of the horses have left the left there. <laughs> you think, no, no, no. And that if you're not careful, you end up going for such a. It, it then you, you take the life out of it just by trying to make it back match what you were, you were yeah. used to. How terrifying was it to play the movie for Elton John the first time? Well. Yeah, he, 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 we had a screening um, just prior can, to Cannes that he had a look at, but it was actually in Nice or somewhere, it was somewhere in the... It, uh, was, in, it was during the mix, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And uh, um, so we agreed to FaceTime afterwards and talk about it. And, uh, because he wasn't, he wasn't, a, he, he no, wasn't involved at all. He, did. Bit, he went more behind the scenes, he watched a lot, but yeah. he didn't come into the... He wasn't hanging out with you guys on the dub stage. He was not. <laughs> so I think everyone was very nervous about his reaction, but it was it was lovely. He was he's he was been very magnanimous throughout the whole thing. I think giving letting the filmmakers once Taron was on board and he'd made his choice about that, and I think once Giles had done some of the orchestrations, he he really did let everyone just go with it. It must have been a deeply surreal experience. Can you imagine for him to watch his life up there, watching him being played, and yeah. then obviously these songs are his songs, but they're treated in a very different way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He absolutely encouraged that. Yeah, he did, didn't he? And that was the, that yeah. was the thing that allowed everyone to... Because I, I was worried for a while. I thought, well, we can't change that. Sure. We can't do that. And Dexter said, yeah, yeah, that's the whole point. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. Be bold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. be bold, yeah. But, uh, you know, obviously you've got to see the evidence of that, haven't you? But, but he encouraged yeah. that, didn't he? He I totally yeah. did, and he was very... Didn't you go to that? I forget. Someone went to that. Who, I who, Maybe you didn't go to that screening. Not the screen. I went to the Turin screening, but not that one. Yeah, so terrible. Yeah, yeah, it must have been hard to yeah, sit yeah. with him in there. I would apparently, have, I would he stopped the film. Didn't he stop the film at one screening because he was so emotional? He got so emotional. Yeah. He had to Aww. stop the film and go out and collect himself. In an Elton way. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, I think he did, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Uh, I, I want to ask each of you a favorite, a favorite sound moment that you just get, you get really... You get really happy in a, in a screening when it when it when you know it's coming up. For me, it's the Rocket Man sequence. I just thought that was really epic, and 
just the whole, probably the design of the whole thing was just really good. I really enjoyed the whole thing. Not even sound, just as a moment, really enjoyed that. Yeah, I think Honky Cat for me is quite good fun yeah. in terms of... Um, for, have, have describe the, the sequence a little bit, just very briefly for anybody who may not have uh, so seen it. So it's, it it's when Elton first starts realising, well, John Reed, um, the, the, his manager who they get together, makes him realise this is the world you're going to go into now, this this world of showbiz. And and that's it's such a good way of expressing that and showing what that world is and the allure of it compared to the, the kind of really bland and rather sober world that he's from and, and that he's trying to escape really so it's such a good sequence in that sense but just musically and sound wise there's lots of nice kind of moments to rhythmically work with the music and it really lends itself to that because of the nature of the, the scene so yeah, yeah. yeah. oh I you know I, I prefer I, the song I love the most is Tiny Dancer uh, but the the, 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 the the troubadour for me is the moment sonically where I, I just think it works so well, and that moment, and the shifts from fantasy to reality are so bold. Uh, and I love that. I love that whole chunk. It's just a, it's a really great part of the movie, and it really sets up the movie. Even, you know, at that point you think, oh, this is going to be really, really interesting. You know. Yeah. I agree that the troubadour and that on the parts around it, the music we used, but also I quite like some of the subtle parts in the film where he's, he's sat at backstage at the Albert Hall and you can hear a, bit, a little bit of the crowd but in a kind of stylized way and he's lonely and there's a bit of score in there so and yeah a mixture. Obviously Dexter has had this very odd experience of doing Bohemian Rhapsody and then coming and doing this film but but stylistically the two could not be more in kind of opposition to each other and I, I think that just the the fantastical way that that you that you all use sound design and music um, really makes it into it's almost operatic in a way it's really it's a it's a wonderful track yeah was there anything did he did he come back from that experience saying like well now that I've done that I know I don't want to do <laughs> Was that ever part of the conversations? I, if I'm correct, I think he was on to do uh, Bohemian Rhapsody as directing it early on. He got involved with that very early. And then didn't direct it, and then got asked to finish it. Sure. So I think for him, you know, he, he couldn't really author it in the way perhaps he wanted to. I, I speak it. Uh, no, no, it's true, because yeah. I was going to do that with him. Yeah. The Bohemian, I read the script, the early one, and it was more like Rocket Man. Interesting. It was a, not so much the... And kind of literal, element, but, yeah. the, but it was harder. Yeah, a bit, you know, more of the kind of gritty, and and I think that's why 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 Rocket Man. I think he, if given the choice, he wanted to make the film more, the the Rocket Man even more. It may have even emboldened him to go further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He yeah. wanted it to be Maybe. more even than it is the one the one that's on the screen now. Yeah. So I think that that yeah, it was a reaction to from to that. I think. Yeah. You know. Well, fantastic. Well, gentlemen, thanks uh, Thanks for coming in and talking to us today. Uh, Chris, Mike, Matt, Danny, congratulations on Thank you. fantastic work on this amazing film. Thank you. Uh, this is Glenn Kaiser signing off again from the uh, Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>